welcome to this Lenten journey at Shandon Presbyterian Church. We begin today here with Ash Wednesday. Lenten journey will flow through the next 40 days to Jerusalem and to the cross. We hope you will join us for all our many Lenten services and Sunday services that we will have throughout this season of Lent. Blessings on you and your journey to the cross. Please now join me in the call to worship. We are invited into the story, into this space, into this hour of worship. We are invited into reflection, into community, into our own spiritual journeys. We are invited, the broken and bruised, the hopeful, the new, the faithful, the doubting, the wondering, the waiting. We are invited because God so loved. So listen, trust the invitation and bring your whole self. All are invited here. Let us go now to God in prayer. God of holiness, your day comes near. And we tremble not out of fear, but from awe and gratitude. For on your day we are fully known, completely restored, reconciled to you forever. Jesus Christ, grace bearer, as we come to your fast, may we be filled with your hope. As we receive your gifts, may our hearts be open to others. As we begin our journey with you, may we put no roadblocks in the path to Jerusalem. Holy Spirit, creator of clean hearts, as water rushes into an empty hole, may your sacramental silence 
fill the emptiness of our souls. God in community, holy in one, our treasure, our hope, our joy, be with us now in this journey, in this time. Bless us on our way. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Friends, will you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, we ask that you would help us to hear these holy words with curious hearts, with open minds, and with your love. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Friends, the scripture reading today is from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, and then 12 through 17. Listen now for a word from God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even the infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It was a year ago today that we last exchanged these words in a service like this one. We stood in line here in the sanctuary and bowed our heads as a thumb covered in oil and ash touched our foreheads. We felt short lines being drawn and we were left with a cross on our skin and a promise in our hearts. The promise that we will return to dust one day the promise that in life and in death we belong to God, and the reminder that over and over again we are invited to return to God with our whole selves. I am profoundly aware that last year's Ash Wednesday service is one of the last points of physical contact that we've had with one another before our in-person gatherings were halted. Less than two weeks after Ash Wednesday, we had postponed our annual retreat and moved to online worship. Those 40 days of Lent we started last year have for many been drawn out for an entire year. 
a year of fasting from fellowship and friends, a year of more solitude and reflection than any one person ever needs, a year of contemplating our mortality and the mortality of the ones we love. Therefore, as we stand here today at the beginning of a new season of Lent, we might ask ourselves, what's new about it? The darkness doesn't seem to end. We are weary and we're looking for a way out. We are not the first people to ask these questions and we will not be the last. For centuries when human beings find ourselves facing inescapable catastrophes, we seek answers for why, what, and how long. Today's scripture lesson is no different. As we read the words of the prophet Joel, we need to first understand the context he is speaking from. The Israelites are facing their own environmental disaster of epic proportions. They're in a state of emergency because a plague of locusts has arrived, threatening their very survival. Now here in Columbia, South Carolina, we don't know much about swarms of locusts, but they are no joke. They can be just as problematic and dangerous today as they were during the time that Joel was writing. In an article from NPR dated from June of last year, the scope of the locust problem was described in detail. Today, swarms are most intense in East African countries, including Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia. But data from the Food and Agricultural Organization shows steadily worsening infestations across Southwest Asia and the Middle East. When locusts descend upon a town or village, they move fast, destroying everything edible in their path. An adult desert locust that weighs only two grams, about a fraction of an ounce, can consume roughly its own weight daily. So a swarm of just one square kilometer, about a third of a square mile, can consume as much food as would be eaten by 35,000 people in one day. And depending on the time of year, locusts can destroy 50 to 80% of all crops. The last large locust outbreak, which started in 2003 and lasted until 2005, resulted in an estimated $2.5 billion in crop damage. Studies found that the economic effect was largely felt by farmers. But children who also grew up during the period were much less likely to go to school because of the hardship. Making matters worse, many of the countries slammed with the worst infestations are already hobbling from protracted crises, recovering from recessions, fighting natural disasters, racked by conflict, and now the coronavirus outbreak as well. I share all of this with you to help you understand that this is the size of the disaster facing the Israelites when we say a plague of locusts. Locusts covering the sky with darkness and fields with destruction. Something that threatens their survival, their way of life as they know it. A catastrophe that will take years to recover from if recovery is possible at all. And yet, out of such an impossible situation sounds the voice of a prophet, 
a voice that comes in the name of the one who gives life and breath to all beings. Joel speaks to the people at a time when they need most to hear from God. In his words to the Israelites, Joel begins by sounding an alarm. Verses 1 and 2 starts with trumpets blaring and the very earth drawing attention to the disaster that's upon them. There is panic. There is fear. There's an uncertainty of what will happen next. There's an air of anxiety in these sentences that's easy to feel in our own present pandemic context. But then the tone changes. Did you notice it? The shift in verse 12. The voice of the Lord sounds out. Yet even now, return to me with all your heart. Rend your hearts, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Verse 12 transitions from a cry for alarm to a call for repentance, a call for turning, a call to relinquish the fear of uncertainty that the people are so desperately clinging to a call to return to the Lord. The verb return used in this verse in Hebrew means to arrive again at the initial point of departure. So when the Lord says return, it means that we have originally been with God. That's where we started out. We moved away from God and now we are invited to come back home. Last year, on this day, at the beginning of Lent, that was our cry for alarm. COVID-19 descended upon us like a swarm of locusts and has threatened all that we hold dear. The trumpets sound, we shut down so much of our lives, and we have watched as the pandemic has devoured parts of us that give us meaning and purpose. Since that moment, we have been stuck in alarm mode. When the pandemic arrived, our bodies, our minds, our spirits moved into a state of extreme stress and fear. It's not unlike when our bodies go into a fight or flight mode when we panic. It's a safety measure that protects us, but is only meant to last for a short amount of time, not a year or more. So if Lent last year was our cry to alarm, then Lent this year is the invitation for transformation. Lent this year is when we hear the voice of the Lord inviting us to return home. Remember, the Lord says, yet, even now, because there is a possibility of reprieve from our current situation. Yet, even now, implies that a transition is taking place. And it's also a recognition that God knows what we are going through. The skies are dark, the land trembles, it is as bad as it can get, and yet, even now, says the Lord, especially now, return to me with all of your heart. In the deepest valley of our pain and suffering, the voice of the Lord invites us back home. Returning to our initial point of departure, returning to the one in who, in who promises that we are never alone. 
after all, we cannot go on in this heightened state of distress indefinitely. We were not made for that. Instead, an invitation is being made to us that another way is possible. Through the lips of the prophet, we are being shown who we might become in the days and weeks to come. A people that rely on God's mercy and grace. A people who understand that we are all interconnected. A people who depend upon the promises of God. The invitation is here. The question for us now is are we humble enough to accept it? Human beings struggle to admit that we need to depend on anyone or anything. We usually associate the season of Lent with guilt or innocence, but Joel is speaking in terms of pride or humility. We struggle independently with the what's, the how's, and the why's of life, and we forget about the who. We ignore our creator and our connection to one another. As much as we need God, and we depend upon God's presence, our stubborn pride keeps us from responding to God's invitation that is sitting there waiting for us. Joel's message challenges us because we are buoyed by our own relative sense of stability and security. We tend to take God's favor for granted and we assume that church attendance or our charitable contributions are enough. We make the assumption that we can and should secure our future for ourselves and then look to God to bless the arrangements we've made. When really, it's the other way around. God invites us to return with genuine repentance, to rend our hearts and not our clothes. God wants our whole person, not just an outward sign. Hearing this passage today on Ash Wednesday, remembering that without God we are simply dust, reminds us that apart from God, we are nothing. This Lent, if we are to make the transition from that cry of alarm to returning to God, it starts with us admitting our helplessness and our full dependence upon God. For the Israelites, admitting they were helpless during a plague of locusts was difficult. For us, Admitting that we are helpless during a pandemic might be unbearable. It's easier to admit guilt than helplessness. But friends, it is only in recognizing our vulnerability that we will allow ourselves to accept God's invitation. Only with open hearts and vulnerable hearts, can we return to God? And that is our task this Lenten season. In her book, Help, Thanks, Wow, author Anne Lamont describes the way she returns to God and reminds herself of her dependence upon God. She keeps what she calls a God box. Now this can be any sort of container, an actual box itself, the ashtray in her car, an empty pill container, or really any kind of container that has lids that close well. She then takes a note, a piece of paper, 
and she writes down a situation or a person that might be distressing her or making her angry, something that she knows she can't handle on her own. She writes it down and then she folds it up very small. She places it in her container and closes the lid and promises to keep her hands off of it until she hears back from God. She says a small prayer. And she says these words. The willingness to do such a childish thing comes from the pain of not being able to let go of something. When we think we can do it all ourselves, fix, save, buy, or date a nice solution, it's hopeless. We're going to screw things up. With a God box, you're finally announcing to the universe that you can't do it, that you have ruined things enough for the time being. So we release ourselves from the absolute craziness of trying to be our own or other people's higher power. Friends, it's time to come home. It's time to use our God boxes, whatever they may look like. There is an invitation in front of you and it's real, it's not going anywhere. It has your name on it and it comes directly from the one who first breathed life into you, making you so much more than dust. Our task this season of Lent is to return to God, to turn our alarms off and to rely on the grace and mercy of God's steadfast love. This year, it's not about guilt or innocence. It's about admitting that we can't do this thing on our own. And perhaps that is the most difficult task we have. As you receive ashes on your forehead today, May this be the beginning of your return to your initial point of departure. May the lines on your skin be the roadmap for your journey home. Home to the God that created you, that claims you, and continues to claim you until we are dust again and beyond. May it be so. Amen. Let us join in a moment of prayer together. First, silently, let us pray. God, we love you. Help us love you more. Amen. Friends, Ash Wednesday is a special day because it marks the start of something new. We are standing at the door of a journey into deeper faith, and God is inviting us in. However, we know that we cannot grow deeper and be transformed without God's help. So as we begin this season, we confess together, asking for God's participation in this new beginning. We are asking God to hold open the door. Let us pray. Holy God, we know that you are near, for you are always here, gathered among us just a breath away. And despite knowing your nearness, we still stumble over ourselves, 
unsure of how to pray. Have mercy on us, O God. So often we talk to you like a stranger, praying prayers of small talk about the weather and surface-level concerns. We keep genuine fear and doubt tucked into corners, out of sight, out of mind. Have mercy on us, O God. And so often we try to think our way to you, as if we could use logic or our minds alone to explain your great unknown. We forget what we knew as children. We forget how to feel our way to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. And too regularly, we limit our experience of you to one hour a Sunday, missing your constant invitation into the holiness all around us. Forgive us guide us. Have mercy on us, O oh God. We are here. We want to begin again. Amen. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And he said, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry, and anyone who trusts in me will never be thirsty. Because he said, I am the vine. I am the true vine. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. He also said, anyone who wants to live their life and follow me must first lose their life. But then he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And ultimately, he said, come and follow. And he said, taste and see. And so we who follow Christ are gathered at this table, as we so often do. We gather at this table to taste and see and remember that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Gracious God, this table is more crowded than usual. For right alongside the bread of life and the cup of salvation sit the ashes of our mortality, nestled right in as if they belong. Maybe that is just as it ought to be, for we cannot fully grasp and be grateful for the gifts of this table if we are not aware of how much we need them. You have heard our prayers of confession week after week, O oh God. We have never hidden them from you. And so we cannot help but wonder, when did you first realize how much you could love such dust? Was it when you breathed life into us? It must have taken an enormous breath, and dust has a way of getting caught in our lungs. But maybe we, your dust-filled children, maybe that is the moment we got caught in your heart. Help us to remember that, won't you? When we feel like little more than dirt, all scuffed around. When we feel like we have been burned by life. When the world itself seems to be on fire. In those moments, in every moment, help us remember that we are marked. Marked not for sorrow and not for shame. Marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are. Help us remember that we are marked with love, as those who know what you can do with dust, with dirt, with the ordinary stuff of this world. Dust of the earth, wheat of the field, fruit of the vine. We gather at this table surrounded by nothing special, and yet it is somehow everything we need. So come to us in these elements, O God, and strengthen us for the journey. Help us remember that what we have to offer is always enough in your eyes. From dust we came and to dust we shall return. But until that day comes, O oh God, stay with us and fill us with all good things. Strength and courage to do what is right. Vulnerability and hope, 
that we might be honest with ourselves and with each other, patience and faith to sustain us in hard times, grace and truth to help us find our way home, trusting in your mercy to do all that and even more. We make our prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So remember with me how on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered all of his friends around him, including the one who would go on to betray him. He gathered them all together and he took bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And having blessed it, he broke it, and he shared it with them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, and it is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it was then in the same way that he took the cup, and he poured it out, and he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant. It is sealed in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do so remembering me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that every time, friends, each and every time we share this bread and this cup, we proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us keep the feast. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks for the gifts of this table, those that we are used to finding here and those that are more out of place. May this table always be a place of sustenance, but also a place of surprise, for both of these things contain holiness, for everything contains you. May we be made holy by the gathering and partaking in your name we pray, amen. And now, friends, that we have been fed by Christ, we are now marked once again as Christ's own forever. You are invited to take the card that you received from the church and press it against your forehead, allowing the charcoal to transfer, because from dust we came and to dust we all return. And may this dust always remind us that we are beloved by God and we belong to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
friends, remember, you are dust, and to dust you will return. And that dust is held by a God who is faithful and steadfast. Now as you go from this time of worship, may the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home once again into this space. Amen.